I'm Emily Freeman. I'm the head of community engagement at AWS. And I'm so excited to be here with you all. We're like kicking off reInvent today. Ooh, thank you. <laughs> awesome. And, uh, I'm Kubis Bernard, and I'm a senior developer advocate with AWS. And as you can hear, I'm not from around here. Moved to the States end of last year with all drama. Where, so, where are you from, though? South Africa. So, <laughs> is that your American accent? Like, no, that's okay. a funny American accent. Well, he did a bad American accent, so we had oh, to cut his okay. mic. Um, <laughs> no, South African. South African? South no, South, South with an F. Oh, I like it. Cool. We were supposed to be joined by Julie Gunderson. She is ill, unfortunately, and won't be able to join us. But we wanted to say hello and wish her well. So if you'll join me in wishing her well to the video, I would appreciate it. One, two, three. Feel better, Julie? <laughs> Thank you. Just to quickly go over what we're going to talk about today. We're going to kind of review simplifying the software delivery process, uh, DevOps practices, infrastructure as code, tooling, a balanced infrastructure approach to DevOps, if there is such a thing, and yes, dealing with failure. We embrace failure. Um, and then finally, and I'm really excited about this, Kovas is going to walk us through a hands-on demo using GitHub Actions with Terraform. And I'm going to supervise his work and ask him questions throughout to make him nervous. <laughs> Feature my performance tree. This is us. <laughs> we have, oh, you can't yeah. even see it. You would see some really cool 8 bit okay. animations of us uh, with our, you know, now. doing a little dance. But we're going to work through this. Yes. OK. So I think we know intrinsically that what we do is hard. But I don't think we actually take the time to fully appreciate just how different our work is today versus five or 10 years ago. <laughs> we have the most capable tooling anyone in software has ever had. We have access to compute power and storage that previous generations could not even dream of. But here we are. We're still dealing with daily frustrations. And I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that we have to decide on which tools and processes and new methodolo methodologies to adopt. And then we have to make all those tools integrate together. It's a lot of work on top of already complicated systems. On top of all of that, there is endless pressure to move faster and to never Those pain points can often look like this. Teams are siloed. They're blocked at almost all stages. I mean, Raise your hand if you've had to deal with this kind of chaos and confusion in your day-to-day -day work. I certainly have. Only three, four people. Only three, four people. Someone's not being honest. <laughs> They're still asleep. It's the first day, two hands. I like that. <laughs> Thank you for your commitment. Um, when you a friction, you can miss deadlines. You feel like you have tons of pressure. And this is especially important right now as we move faster and faster. Being able to operate reliably, consistently, and provide value to your end customer is deeply valuable. CICD, pipelines, DevOps practices, all of this gives us agility. By moving at this higher velocity, we can build more effective teams under a DevOps cultural model, which emphasizes values, such as ownership and accountability and a willingness to fail. There's really six key DevOps practices that we want to talk about today. The first is continuous integration. This is really the software development practice where developers regularly merge their code changes back into a central code repository. Why are you causing problems? Keep, keep coming closer to me and then Sorry. am I? Always no. <laughs> Don't run away, Kovas. <laughs> So you all, like, this is very common. CI, the CI part, I think a lot of us actually operate on. The CD aspect, this continuous delivery or continuous deployment, is where things get a little bit more dicey. This is where you have an automated test suite. Your code automatically either gets merged in or, if you're very bold, deployed to production. Microservices are key, though apparently there's become debate around that. Um, that's fine. <laughs> I can't look, I can't wait next year's talk on uh, making your microservices a monolith. That'll be exciting. 
Um, okay, so now you have infrastructure as code. We all kind of understand this. Sometimes we call it GitOps. It's really about taking infrastructure and making sure that it's provisioned and managed like we would with code. We actually store it in our source repositories like you would application code. Monitoring and logging is super, super important. I think sometimes we forget it, because it's kind of old school. Like I feel like we've always had monitoring and logging. You just SSH to the server. Yeah, there you go. See, it's fine. <laughs> DevOps practices. But really capturing and categorizing and being able to go back and review what worked, what didn't work, and why, I think is key to a lot of this, especially if you're handling an incident. Mm. Finally, my favorite thing, communication and collaboration it is absolutely required that we are capable of communicating with our team honestly and openly, that we aren't hiding things, that we have this failure first kind of culture. Emily, you broke the build again. I know, yeah. I wanted to, wouldn't it be if you got <laughs> awards? Like if you broke a build and you got like a sash, you're like, I broke it today. Yeah, sash of shame. No, that's not the point. Um, but yeah, it's very, very important that we have this kind of culture. Looping back quickly to infrastructure as code, since that's core to this session, when we talk about IAC, we're really talking about managing the IT infrastructure in an automated way, using configuration files versus GitOps, which builds upon infrastructure as code by further automating with Git repositories. We could spend truly all day on IAC. Not everyone builds stuff on top of Kubernetes, though, and so um, you know, that's where you really see GitOps kind of shine. Yeah, and I mean, we quickly threw this one together just to give an idea of what infrastructure as code and or GitOps can look. Um, and we were chatting about this earlier, and I mean, when you get down to what's the difference between DevOps and infrastructure as code and GitOps, it's probably along the lines of messy, but I can sell you five units of it if you want a discount, which is starting to happen with GitOps now as well. It tends to happen as like all of a sudden this idea culture turns into a, here's a product, come buy it. But yeah, fine. Okay, um, so we quickly touched on infrastructure as code. Basically, it's that whole idea of treating it exactly the same. Literally, you've got a repo for your infrastructure. You create pull requests to review it by someone, hopefully, before it goes to production. It goes through some kind of hopefully, unlike this mic. And then, ultimately, when you merge it to your main branch, it goes out and is automated or deployed in some um, fashion. So. Um, we spoke about a couple of things we're going to be doing, and we've got them in two buckets at the moment, what we're going to be looking at today. You can see a long list of things here. I've played with everything except SaltStack and Spinnaker, which is why they were at the bottom. I was looking for more names. Um, but basically, today, we're just going to focus on terrible actions. Um, this is a lot of fun. So, this organizational nightmare. After implementing the practices we just talked about, we can now shift to something much more simple. And we do this by actually firing pe five people from every team. Um, <laughs> Bye. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I think where we are as an industry, we get a little hand wavy with DevOps, and I might have contributed to this, so I'm sorry. <laughs> I think somewhere along the line, we lost our way. put more and more load onto individuals, specifically individual of DevOps has been this pressure or belief that everyone has to do everything, that a JavaScript has to know just as much about infrastructure and the CI CD pipelines as your operations engineer. That's not exactly the best way to find specialties and to on the other side of that coin, there's been this extreme focus on this developer, and it's left operations engineers feeling a little out less than, somewhat ignored. I'm sure they're wrong. I don't like that. DevOps is not a methodology that encourages everyone to do anything, nor is it one that stack ranks by so that's not we should be able to Our weaknesses. We had something a little like this.
Could sleep um, on things. Not my problem. We would type into our machines, and then when it, the program actually compiled, it was someone else's problem. DevOps really focused on trying to build principles from the developer community into operations. System I believe of DevOps was like this. This is overlap. This is communication. nuance in messaging. This is a compression of ideas and methodologies, and it all led us here. I think it's important for people to have ownership and accountability over the services they build. But we need to reverse out. Infrastructure as code or GitOps is and repeatable. This is awesome. The people who do that work have to identify. For me, a balanced approach means that there are fundamental, opinionated approaches to infrastructure at the organizational level, and that every individual service team can benefit from the existing account environments, pipelines, and more. You can call it a platform team or an SRE team. It doesn't really matter. The name is much less than the actual impact. So, that's where names don't matter. This job action um, workflow look like. Um, you can see it specifically like if you work with any kind of CI CD system, you've got multiple steps inside your pipeline, which you can see in the bottom. And then where the is that um, we're going to use GitHub Actions with our AWS account, and we're not going to be sharing any credentials with it. Uh, we're going to be using uh, one of the new features, Amazon, that allows you to just. That? I think we missed it. Amazon, Amazon Open ID Connect. Thank you. Yes. The permissions, and I'll show you the demo um, how we're going to get all of that going. But this is roughly where I initially aimed for. Um, the demo is going to be slightly different. We won't get anything running up and running because DNS takes time, and I'm starting out a completely new account that I started up. Nothing in it. Um, so this is just me. Image for construction. Looking for something to talk about infrastructure as code. So I thought, you know. Nice, sexy beards, and uh, you know, this is what you do when you plan it. Infrastructure everywhere. <laughs> Chatting to people. Um, can I actually just switch off my mic? I'll do projection loud voice. Sorry? Oh, it's okay. Cool. So, project, can we mute my mic? Ooh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay, I'm still there, I'm still there, I'm not there. Is the mic still on? Can we completely, can I just? Boom. Is one better than the time I had to project with the mic on my beard? Yes, I've done that. So, <laughs> getting back to the important questions. Uh, should you use Terraform, AWS CDK, CloudFormation, or one of the other many tools? Now, my friend and twin from Serbia has an answer to that, if you haven't seen this before on one of our streams. <laughs> yeah that I went through CloudFormation, done a bit of CDK. I've used um, uh, Terraform a lot since about 2014, I think. Um, and, and what that's taught me is that the different tools are kind of with a different mindset. 
every mindset is the same as we know. So in other words, play with at least two. That's the advice. Take one that is declarative, like for example, Terraform or CloudFormation, and then try something else that might be uh, programmatic, like Pulumi or um, CDK. Just give two of them a go, see what happens, you learn things along the way. Um, younger Quivers thought that the tools were crap, that's why I kept on switching, and then later Quivers realized they didn't know how to use them. So yeah, play with a couple to figure out which ones uh, work um, best for you. Then, infrastructure automation always has the Yes, kick it off. So I'll show you now. We're going to cheat a little bit. I've got a little back. A little bit. You personal credit card. I'm going to pay for it. Literally brand new, nothing in that. And where we want to end up is a setup where we've five total accounts. Level Often because it's got the information that's in there. So then right and not only things like this, but anything that's common across all the different environments that you can be spinning up. So if let's say a bull job or a container registry where you want to store your image because you and then finally at the bottom we've got three different um, environments as I call them um, the dev, test and prod and what this lovely image shows you is how we are actually going to be a feature called um, uh, it's, uh, I believe it is, um, where you can assume M roles between different accounts is we will from the GitHub action side reach into the AWS account using OpenID Connect, so no credentials shared there, it's just based on the configuration. And then from there, into the other account. Because like I said, people fiddling around in that. There we go. Okay. Okay. We have a mic. This. Whoa. Right. Which karaoke song first? I believe Final Countdown would be appropriate so we can get to the demo. Alrighty, um, so like I was saying, initially we're going to do that chicken and egg situation. We're going to resolve that with a couple of shell scripts, and then we're going to head over to Terraform and GitHub Actions to provision everything else we do. So it's effectively setting up the permissions for GitHub Actions to get into that main account. It's going to be done by Terraform with GitHub Actions on the billing account. So it's going to reach all the way into that one as well as the environment accounts. And then we set, once that is in place, we kick off a second repo, which is then going to set up everything in our main account that then from there, GitHub Actions comes directly into main, and then from there reaches into the different um, div, um, accounts there. The reason we do this is that it means that in your main account, you set the IAM policies for who can do what. So this is where you'll have a different policy for your engineers that need to work on dev, testing, and staging, and they have different permissions based on which environment they're dealing with. So um, what we're going to try and do is keep the shared infrastructure in the main account. So for example, like I mentioned, the container image system the main account, and then each of the different accounts can reach into it to actually grab a copy when it wants to do a deployment over there. Um, and what this gives you, and the reason I like approaching Terraform this way, is that because we're going to be using variable files, and I'll show all of this with Terraform, there's no copy and pasting of your infrastructure code between your dev, test, and production environment. When you define infrastructure, it's in one repo for, let's say, your base environment or in, for a specific service. And then what you do is you've got variable files to change the quantities, which means if you've got dev and testing may mainly look the same, but then when you start getting into production, um, you want to have maybe a couple more instances of the container up and running. So you just change the variable that defines the quantity of that or the size of that. So there are some you can pull if you don't want to spin up the resources. Then you can do that with a bit of testing. It's 
podcast, but I think I think your mic might be failing again, which again. is killing me. Okay. It's fine. Let's just give up. It's <laughs> That's incredible, though. Thank you. Cool. OK. So the reason for this is we want to get to infrastructure parity, where basically we don't have to deal with, uh, oh, remember, piece of paper, checklist, go create that queue. Or remember to copy and paste it. Because we had an issue where it worked, well, on my laptop and dev, and then didn't work in production. <laughs> Fire. <laughs> <laughs> cool. OK. And with that, we're going to start having fun. We have got about 30 minutes. I'm hoping that's enough to go from nothing to multiple accounts and things running. Cool. I'm excited. Well, let's see if this works. I'm just checking in. Can you hear me OK through this? Thank you. Would it be better for you all if Cobus projected or if we pass the mic around? Pass the mic. I like it. One hand in typing. No challenge whatsoever. Okay, cool. So, um, do I need? I can hold it for you. Oh, oh, nice. I think this makes me like the world's most expensive microphone stand. <laughs> so many inappropriate jokes I can make. Now. <laughs> All right. So okay. How to get started. First, I need to figure out how to get my screen up there. I remember pushing buttons. Do I push them? Jill, push the or how how do we get the screen to show? Remember a red button and a blue green button. Do I do it? I don't know. I feel like this is diffusing something. Ah, there we go. Okay, cool. You're amazing. Um, first up, let's check. Make it a little bit bigger. That's good. Cool. We've got that. We've got this one. Let's just refresh. Can you make it just a little bigger? <laughs> I. <laughs> Y'all. <laughs> That's satisfactory. Perfect. <laughs> cool. it's too early. Um, yes, I know it's too early. Um, so two things I forgot to mention before we kick off the demo. Firstly is this session is being recorded, which is great news for you and terrible news for me, which means if you don't see me here next year, you know why. Um, and secondly, I will be taking everything that I've done here with the different repos and creating a series of tutorials that will publish probably end of Jan or during the course of Jan, because December is reInvent Recovery Month um, and planning. So, But everything will go out. There will be recording. So if I do go a bit quickly, you'll have everything afterwards. So don't worry about that. OK. So remember when I said we need to get things going first? Um, so what I've got here, uh, the colors are OK. Sorry, I should have gone high contrast. Um, but what I've done is I've created a little shell script that is very advanced. It's got five commands, I think. Yeah, five. So effectively, all that this does is it calls some AWS um, endpoints. It creates a S3 bucket for us. Um, it creates, um, it enables versioning on it, because with Terraform, we're going to be using S3 as our back end to store our state file. Um, quick show of hands, who has worked with Terraform and state files before? That's incredible. Nice. It's very popular. OK. For those that haven't, quick version here is what Terraform does is you define what infrastructure you want. You then tell it to go figure out what's going on. It goes and looks at your AWS account or other resources, because it has many other providers. And then it figures out what it has stored from the last run in the state file, what's the difference and it needs to apply. Then it'll go out and when you say, OK, apply, apply those changes to your infrastructure, and then write that to its own state file. So it keeps effectively what it saw the world as lost, what you want the world to look like, and what it actually looks like, and then figures out that mess. And it would solve so many things if we could use this in other areas of life as well. Um, so that is why we need an S3 bucket. Um, so what I'm doing here is just creating it, enabling versioning on it. And then what I'm doing is creating that Amazon OpenID Connect provider. And what you can see over here is literally it is provided by the URL. So that's where the request is going to come from. There's a little thing, fingerprint for the certificate that GitHub supplies. It's public. You can get it off their site. So nothing special there. And then what we're doing is we're creating that IAM role that gives the GitHub Actions permission to actually access our account and, and do things in our account. And then also, that's just the, the trust policy portion. And the second part is now, what can I do in the account is the actual IAM policy. And this is a demo. So obviously, I'm going with YOLO admin rights. Um, you can lock this down. You can have multiple different roles. You can really get very fine-grained here if you want to. Um, I just want it to work at the moment. Um, so. We've got this script. So what I've done is I have preemptively copied it over here. Um, oh, 
I was waiting for that. There we go. Uh, there we go. Do I remember it? Yes. Okay. Also, don't be like me. Put MFA on. Yeah, that was a short password, Kobus. <laughs> can, can, can we stop with that? I'm getting self-conscious now. It's cool. All that I've done in this new account, you can see there fresh, literally last night, I've created the, um, it's on the screen, yeah, the script, so the bootstrap one. So this is the script I just copied across. Um, and in here, um, you can see there's a brand new name and uh, just the name for the IAM role. The rest is all standard in here. And then in the actual trust policy. In here, what we can see, it says, is uh, the principle, uh, the federated principle, so that's the identity that we're allowing in. Is, or is via this specific um, uh, open ID provider. Uh, and the one thing you do have to paste in here is the account ID. So I pre-pasted that last night when I created it. And other than that, in here, the way the magic really happens off screen, because it's too big, is here's where you limit who can run this. And this part is extremely important, because if you, sorry, do not, if you set this just to a wildcard string, it means that any GitHub repo can do this. So if I see your public repo and I fork it, I can go and, yeah, order you some shoes. I don't know. I would no, love shoes. That's not how it works. Oh, we didn't tell them about our shoes. Oh, yes, sorry. Did you all notice that we have AWS shoes? OK. <laughs> I think they're cool. <laughs> they are. Right, cool. So this is the part where you want to focus. Um, see, Emily, focus. No. This. OK. Um, so you can see here what I did is that I specifically uh, limited to a repo in my um, account uh, called uh, BOA328-billing-fresh. And the colon asterisk is the wildcard all the different branches um, in, Git, uh, or in GitHub to allow if I want to do a PR versus a main branch, et cetera. But you can limit this, once again, to different things, which gives you interesting options to say, well, when I'm doing a PR, I've got these permissions, but when I'm doing a main merge, I've got different permissions, and you can actually manage it here and set it. Obviously, if someone knows how the things are set up um, and they have access to your source repos, you're kind of already slightly in trouble. Um, but yeah, so that's what we've got here. So with that, we are going to quickly run that. And this is the first part where I hope I didn't break anything. So we've got our buckets. We've got our open ID connect. Uh, open ID connect. We've got the role. Is this not done? Oh, yes. We have to quit. It's, there we go. It seemed to work perfectly. OK. So, so far, so good. Um, nothing has really happened. But what I can show you now is if we go to the console. Um, oh, nice. Uh, that is very big. It's massive. Keepers. OK. We're going to be jumping between these a lot. OK. I am, I am here. Cool. And we go to identity providers. We should see our GitHub Actions identity provider set up here. Ooh, OK. That's horrible. Um, yeah. But that was just from what we set up, correct? Yeah. That didn't pre-exist. We only created a bucket. We versioned it. We set up the open ID um, connect. And then we created an IAM role with a policy attached to it and a trust policy. Cool. So nothing too, much, too fun now. So now the really fun part comes where things can go wrong because I need to start copying things. So what I've got here is I have a repo. And that was still early in the morning. I did a nice cleanup. So we're starting off with nice empty repos as well because we're going to do this properly. We now have our infrastructure's code Bootstrap, so we can start creating a PR and then start setting everything up. Obviously, a couple of steps there with dependencies, but let's get this going. Okay. So, is that? Yeah, that's big enough. Cool. I'm not laughing. Um, so, wh firstly, what have we got? Uh, we have got uh, some Terraform over here. The important part is the providers one, which we set up first. So, what we did is, that's already the first thing I have to fix, because I remember my notes now, which I didn't make, uh, is what did I call my bucket? There we go. Because this is the first thing that'll break if it can't find that bucket. So there we go. That's my new bucket. And then all I'm saying over here is when you configure Terraform, it uses the um, what's known as HCL, HashiCorp uh, configuration language. It's JSON-like syntax, except you don't have to deal with a lot of the quotes around things. You can put commas at the end of lists and not have to worry about it. Uh, it's very nice. Um, here we say, OK, the backend is S3. 
Um, and what we're doing is we're saying the required providers here is just AWS, and you can do some version management here if you want to pin the specific versions. Then what we're doing over here is you can say we see we're saying we're going to use US East 1. Um, and the reason this is different from that region is the top region is where is my configuration state file stored? So we say bucket region. This is where am I creating uh, infrastructure by default uh, when using the AWS provider. Okay. Then um, what we have over here is this is the part I still need to comment out because we don't have accounts yet. Um, so do that, and that's where it's going to break. But we're going to get to that part back. But so for now, we've got our, we can talk to our billing account and we can use things. Then in terms of the actual content we're going to be creating is we'll see in the main account, everything is commented out. Lovely, can't break. In the environment accounts, everything is commented out, can't break. Uh, DNS, which is always fun, is also commented out. So what we effectively have here is we've just set up the basics for Terraform to be able to do things, but we don't specify anything yet. So first step is let's quickly uh, put that on a PR branch to see if our stuff is working. So. It's commented out as a default? Yeah. That's useful. Uh, no, no, I added that. Oh. It's artisanal. Terraform. Artisanal Terraform. I like it. Uh, is that just like Terraform that's twice as expensive? Yeah. Got it. But you get discount on five units. <laughs> Cool. Well, I need to do this. I'm lazy. I always forget this command, so I just copy and paste. YOLO. Okay, cool. Well, that is pushing. The one part I didn't touch on here is this little friendly file over here, which is uh, the thing that tells GitHub how to actually run the workflows. So there's a YAML file over here with a bunch of steps. Uh, so effectively, give it a nice name, some info, um, and then you specify when it run runs. So we've got it running on the branches of main and also on all pull requests. And then it needs some permissions here. The ID token is um, required to do the JWT token exchange with OpenID, so you need to give it the right permissions there. And then for the content itself, in this one, it's read only. Um, it doesn't need write, because it's not writing to the repo itself. What it does do a bit further down, which I'll show you, is actually writes a comment on the PR itself. So what it does then is does the checkout, um, which is just normal, um, and this is where the magic happens with the OpenID Connect, which is I provide it with the IAM role to assume, uh, including the account ID, and I give it some kind of name. In this case, um, the session name is just uh, GH um, Actions Billing, because so I can track it in my uh, logs and see what's happening, um, and that's it. As you can see, I have not copy and pasted a single API key or secret in here, and that's where the fun part comes in. So that's there. Then we just go, we set up Terraform. I love version pinning because I've had issues in the past. Um, then we do a format check, um, which is just Terraform's got a built-in command FMT that tells you whether or not something's formatted correctly, and you'll see that in nice use at the end. That's great. It, it, let me show you the end then. There is my favorite part. If you don't format your Terraform code correctly, I will not allow your build to pass. It will fail. Um, I've had too many religious arguments about what formatting to use. Terraform ships with a default one. So how about we use it and stop arguing? Build some infrastructure. Cool. So getting back to what we have up here. Um, we've in, uh, when you in, um, start with Terraform, you've got the backend configured. And now you're on a new machine. There might be some state files you need to initialize it. It also pulls down the providers, pulls down the uh, plugins, stores in a little um, hidden directory on the actual directory that you're running it from. And then what we have is we first go plans. Terraform's got this lovely feature where it says, this is what I want the infrastructure to look like. Go plan it and show me what those changes are, which is one of the main things that swayed me way back, I think it's 2014 when I started it, is like the ability to see what it wants to do before, you know, enter YOLO, I hope this works on production scenario was like, that sold me, so I, I kept using it. So this will uh, tell us, you know, does it work? What you can see over here is I am saying continue on error which sounds odd at first, but the reason for that is that in the pull request itself, we actually publish the output of the different stages. Did the initialization work, formatting work, uh, the plan work, um, and the validation steps work? That's just a bunch of steps that makes it super easy to make sure that the Terraform is actually accurate. And then what it does is it actually um, publishes the details um, inside the pull request of what happened. So you can see there um, the actual output that you would have in the GitHub run, uh, action runner is pasted here. So you can see what Terraform outputted on the shell while it goes long. Okay, cool. Then it does my little um, formatting check. Um, and then it does here is a step that says if the plan stage failed, we're going to exit this um, workflow. Because we, when we go to production or merge the main, we definitely don't want to um, deploy anything that's broken. Because guess what? 
that you're not going to have a fun thing. So what you'll see there is that that's where it says it'll exit out for that. And you'll see in some of the other steps, uh, for example, the plan one, there's a little if in here. So this is where we only do the planning phase when we are on the branch. Now, I know that you can do the plan and output it to file and then execute that file, which is a bit safer. Um, but with multiple branches and things, especially we go very quickly with infrastructure changes, that sometimes gets a bit messy to handle or you need to do your se sequential builds. Um, so in this case, we're going a little bit YOLO and saying, as soon as you merge to master, we're just going apply, um, auto approve, thank you. Let's hope it works. Cool. So while that was running, um, and it's actually fairly quick, so I don't, oh wait, it didn't run because I didn't click pull request. Let's do that quick. This does run fairly quickly, so actions. Let's go over here. Is this big enough? Yeah, let's make it a little bit bigger. Okay, so it hasn't picked up that file yet. Let's give it a second. Did I push? Yes, I pushed. No, this just takes a while for it to pick it up. Come on. Did I? Sorry? No, no, I'm not intending to merge. I want this to run on the pull request. Um, so, let's see, let's hope it works. It, did I actually include, wait, wait, you know what? Uh, let's double check if I included the GitHub file. That is. Okay, um, interesting. I was certain this worked last night. Uh, okay. Let's then do the yellow part and merge, because that's uh, you. Come on, merge, confirm merge. Thanks for that. I actually forgot about, I didn't know about that part. Cool. There we go, thank you. You're awesome. Yes. Wanna come take over? <laughs> cool. So. Now what we've got going here is uh, GitHub Actions is starting. Oh, sorry, not that one. This one over here, we can see it running through the different steps. It's hanging on this one, and this is the one where I always get nervous, because when it hangs here, it means that I messed up something with the IAM policy. Uh, I get the feeling I'm going to go back to my backup account. Let's see quickly. OK, this is taking too long. If that takes too long. It means that my in here, let's get my account ID. Please don't steal this. Actually, you can shouldn't do anything. Um, let's double check. Actually, in here, I am. Roles. GitHub Actions. Uh, where's my? No, sorry, I just have to go a little bit smaller. Trust relationship. I've got that in there. Is that this? Uh, edit. Oof, this is rough. Let's double check I got that right. Yep. And I have got the, oh, sorry. Good example here. The IAM policy was set up with what I thought was going to be a new repo, and I decided not to change that. So that is why it's breaking. So now you can see is if you don't have the right IAM role, it actually will not allow you to um, do anything in the account, which means this should have failed by now. Sweet. Now, uh, let's just cancel. Come on, sorry. Uh, yeah, there. Any good jokes for us, Emily? I do. Um, there was a snail, and the snail <laughs> wanted to buy a sports car, so he goes to the dealership, and he asks for a sports car. He asks for a red sports car. So the dealer's like, no problem, we've got that. And the snail's like, just one more thing. The dealer's like, sure, what do you want? He's like, I want an S on the back of the car. The dealer's like, okay, we can do that, but I mean, why? So that when people see me drive by, they say, look at that S car go. <laughs> no. Thank you, thank you. Cool. Okay, sweet. So what has happened now in the meantime is that that was actually the issue, so it's working. And I forgot to open up the one in here. This one actually had code in it. So this is our starting point where we're going to set up some new AWS accounts. So I'm using Terraform to actually build all those other um, child accounts, the, the main one, the dev, test, and production one as well that are found in here. A uh, fun trick for those that are not familiar with this is that in this instance, you can see I just use different emails on my personal domain just to get it in there. But if you do want to use the same mailbox, you can literally just put a plus there and put whatever you want in there and then reuse the same mail address. That plus it'll just still be in the mail 
um, all the two mail, but it'll came to the same email box. So lots of fun things you can do there, not to have to set up like a million mailboxes just to set up more AWS accounts. But in any case, um, what we could see here in the background now was that this, is it still running? Can make it a little bigger. Oh, yes. There we go. It actually is completed successfully. And now, if we go in here and look at AWS organizations, we should see a lot of fun over here. So, oh, come on, sorry, I hit the touchpad. What we can see is we've got our main account, we've got our dev production and test account, um, and then also I've set up the organizational units to actually do a tiered effect in terms of just for, uh, to keep it nice and neat in here. So if you wanna attach like other systems that, because you can connect, for example, um, domain controllers to provide permission to certain environments and things here, you can do a lot of interesting integrations if you want. But the important part for us is that I need to get some account IDs. So we're gonna pop these across and we're gonna go over here into this variables. So I need the main one, I need the, and this is hopefully the last of the copy and pasting we have to do. Uh, this is not gonna go well, let's not switch test and prod. And this has to, <laughs> switch test and prod, why not? Um, this has to be manual, there's no way to automate this part. Um, no way to automate it in an easy way. You can go funky and say, split the Terraform into multiple like, units where as soon as the first one completes, you output the uh, account IDs into a file, then kick off the second one. I just feel when it gets that complicated for something you're gonna do once, hopefully twice maybe, um, don't go that far, it gets a bit rough. There's a very nice XKCD on it, uh, cartoon, uh, so xkcd.com, search for, um, I think it's uh, worth automation, where it gives a nice little graph about the time of automation spent on something versus how much you get back out of it. Definitely go look at that. Okay, cool. So now we're getting along nicely. We have got about seven minutes left. Let's see if we can get a container built in an env environment set up. Um, so we've got our accounts. Now what we're going to do is we are going to go provision that main account so we can actually get um, get up actions to work directly with it. So this is just the same as we had in that um, uh, bash script, which is creating the different uh, the bucket with the rules around it and versioning, setting up the IAM policy. A little bit different in here where it allows different um, IDs or to go to the different accounts there as well. Um, and then here's where we set up the Open ID Connect uh, provider again for GitHub. Um, and yeah, a lot more IAM policies just to deal with all the permissions from going from GitHub Actions into main, into dev, prod, and testing. So that is that part. Um, then what we also wanna do is we wanna reach into the developing, uh, the developing test and production accounts to set up the required roles there because now we want, because when we're coming in from billing, main at the moment can't get into those three accounts. We set that up as well to allow main in and then get up actions from that side. Um, cool. And then the last part, which is why I won't be doing a live live demo is we always have to deal with DNS, uh, which is fun. Um, so this sets up three DNS zones, one in dev, test, and production. And how it works is dev's got the subdomain dev, testing is test dot whatever, and then production is the main production one. And then what you'll see is we do zone delegation with the name servers for, from the prod one to the um, test one as well as the dev one. And the way this works is you tell DNS, use that subdomain, there's the name server, that name server, and that account then deals with any queries to it. Is that a warning bell, almost? Okay, let's go quickly. So we've got DNS in here as well. So now what we're gonna do is we need to go um, quickly, uh, get add, uh, okay. Did I? Yes, thank you. Someone is listening, I'm so happy it's... Cool, the reason for this is now, just quickly on that one, um, is that to be able for a Terraform to go into the different accounts, you need to tell it like, how do I do it? What roles do I assume? Which is what we've got over here and using the alias function of providers. So I'm saying there's an alias called test, so I'll reference it as aws.test as the provider, also in the same region, and how it's gonna get in there is gonna assume this specific role, and here I can interpolate the um, account ID from a variable since I just pasted that, that's available at runtime for the provider. And then once again, just give it a nice session name so your auditing tools know what's happening. So now, with all of this, it should be able to get into those test accounts um, once I remember to merge. Uh, uh, okay, let's push that. That should be over here. Uh, let's quickly, uh, is this the main one? Yeah, compare and pull. No, why is that doesn't look like the right repo? Oh, okay, 
No. Come on. Uh, branches. Uh, demo. Create pull request. Doesn't sound right, but okay. Let us see. Yellow. Okay, code. Wait, am I on the wrong tab? Demo service. No, this is the right one. Sorry. I'm just eyeballing my. Five tabs is better than my typical 560. Cool. So now what we've got here is, okay, we've got this again. What did I miss? Sorry. Oh. This one from the main. Okay, so what this means is I didn't update the IAM permissions here in the main account. Oh, wait, in variables possibly. Nope, they're there. That should all work. Ah. Let's just double check if I'm just too hasty. No, that's definitely not going to work. So, oh, repo names. Let's double check in this one. Did I have a mistake again? Those are fine. Uh, so let's do an add again after you changed your providers. Yeah. Uh, sorry, add? We didn't add once you changed the providers. Oh. Good call. Good call, but that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, okay, get uh, status. Yeah. No, it's in. Add main, cool. Uh, so what I'm concerned about here is the fact that it's um, getting stuck on the credentials side, not on that, which means if my, oh, uh, wait, 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 wait. This over here is the one part that, yeah, there we go, okay. So what happened here now is because there's one more part we have to do things by hand, which is I need to get the main account because this GitHub action is not allowed into the billing account. So once again, security actually doing its job. Um, we're getting creative with names. Yep, YOLO. Wait, wait, what did I do? Oh, pull, pull, now we're gonna go to merge. Okay, cool. Huh? Am I, am I being very, very confused here? Sorry, let me check. I have another joke. Okay. <laughs> it actually came from you earlier. Oh. I know, it's pretty good. Why can't you mate an eel and an eagle? It's eel eagle. Thank you. So bad it's good. I'll be here all week. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, come on. I oh, was so close. Get status. Why does not see the difference here? Let's just put a place space in here. I am in the right folder. Nope, oh, okay, there we go. Nope, Kubis is making mistakes again. Uh, there we go. Maybe we should actually be in the right repo. This is how I treat production, by the way. Okay, there we go. Get status, get add. Okay, that's also on main. That should now solve our little conundrum over there. Uh, there. We are going to start having to go really quick now. Okay, let's just see. This should go past that. No, okay. Ah, uh, I ran out of time. Um, yeah, because the thing is, it's it's ten minutes before the next session, and we want to kind of stop now. So what I will do is I'll stand uh, be outside for any questions other than why th didn't this work, um, <laughs> and. Uh, yeah. You you don't have like finished infrastructure like at a like a cooking show they like pull it out of the oven. I do. That would be the 3 a.m. version because I had an idea to change this last night. So I I wouldn't trust that purpose. In two minutes, what would you have seen had this run? So what would have happened now is that this would have set up the main account and then we we'll, would have pushed the environment account, which would have created a VPC, um, basically in each of the. Uh, environment accounts and then what we would have done in there is as a last little step is we would have created a demo service using a module 
So if you look at that, and what this actually does is it creates the ECR repo, sets up a build job using Terraform to actually create Terraform templates, and the GitHub provider would have created a new GitHub repository with a pre, uh, PR pre-populated with all the Terraform infrastructure with the GitHub um, Actions workflow, and that would have then kicked off your whole let's get the container built, and then you can add in your deployment in there if it had worked now. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. We really appreciate it and your patience with the mic issues.